You're listening to The New Paris. I'm your host, Lindsay Tremuda. It's the week of Thanksgiving, and that seems like an appropriate time to bring back an American friend. Amanda Bankert is a previous guest of this show and the owner and pastry chef at Bone Shaker, the only donut shop in Paris worth your time, money, and sweet tooth. She's just released her first book in English called Voila Vegan. Now, you may be wondering what the connection between donuts in Paris and vegan baking is, but I can assure you there are solid links. We talk about how she got into baking, becoming vegan, how easy it is to find veggie or vegan food in Paris these days, and why all of this fits into evolving tastes in the food capital. Amanda, welcome to the show. Hello. Thanks for having me. Last time you were on, which was like many moons ago, you were joined by Guy Griffin, who yep. owns Café Mericourt. And we were talking about breakfast and brunch and Anglo-inspired foods in Paris. And even that story has changed considerably over the last several years. Um, but today we're going to talk about all about you. Um, and for anyone who doesn't know you or Bone Shaker or haven't yet picked up the latest cookbook, which we're going to talk about today, how does an American who lived in Ireland yes. end up in Paris and baking donuts? Yeah, it's a long story, so I will condense it as much as I can. But um, essentially, I came here initially and went to pastry school at the Cordon Bleu. And I moved to Dublin right after graduation. Um, had my son in Dublin. His dad is from there. Worked as a pastry chef there for almost a decade. And and then moved back here. I always wanted to move back to Paris, though. So I moved back here in 2012. And open bone shaker in 2015. So that is a very condensed version, That's but I amazing. feel like that there, those are the, the main points, the highlights. <laughs> and 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 why donuts? I guess because you know what's interesting is you've been very embraced with these donuts by the French media, by French clients. I mean, you have a majority, uh, yeah, of, the, of French clients, which we can talk about. But you know, initially, and even in 2012, it was still kind of like, oh, Americanization of Paris. I think it was very much. So, yeah, because oh, when we opened the donut shop, donuts didn't exist at all. Like it was still very kind of like slim pickings for that for that kind of stuff. So I decided to do donuts because my background obviously was in French pastry. And when I was working as a pastry chef in Dublin, I was in restaurants. So it was very heavily French influenced. But obviously moving back to Paris, I wasn't going to do French desserts here. You know, um, I knew I wanted to open something and I wanted to do something as well. I'd been in fine dining before, but I really wanted to kind of like take a step back, do something fun, do something different and also something that I wanted to eat. And so it was one of those kind of like light bulb moments where I was trying to kind of figure out what direction I wanted this business. You know, I knew that I wanted to open something, but I was like, how are we going to do it? What are we going to do? And I was home in the States eating a donut. You as, know, you do. as you do, right? <laughs> exactly. And, um, you know, and had one of those kind of just moments where I was like, God, this is so good. And I was like, man, I wish we could get these in Paris. And then it literally was that kind of, I was, oh, oh, there you go. Like, there it is. I'll make handmade, handmade donuts. Now, obviously, you know, 2012, we were still seeing not only a lack of presence of certain baked goods, but also there was sort of a snubbing at first of American products. I like, think very much so. Yeah. yeah. And I don't exactly know when that shifted. Maybe maybe it was closer to 2015 when you did open. But even then, it was still like... It was new. So I think that's... We did hit it at the good moment, I think, because it was right when things were starting to change. And I don't know if you remember, but there was a very brief intense fascination in Paris with all things Brooklyn. Do you remember? Oh, God. Yeah. <laughs> None of which come from Brooklyn. Right, right. exactly. Yeah. But we, so Bone Shaker kind of opened in that period, which again, I wasn't aware of until I started getting requests from journalists to do like, oh, this Brooklyn thing. And I was like, okay. <laughs> <laughs> You're like, do you know that donuts are available in suburban America? <laughs> right, or Exactly. But like, I'll take it, you know. Um, do you remember that uh, the Bon Marché had done, you know, one of the... We were part of that. That's, okay, like, that's okay. actually what I'm referencing. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's hysterical. It's like they've done that with Brazil. They have these thematic, like, cultural focuses yeah. with products and you know they try to tell a story and i just remember thinking like i'm sorry who thought this was <laughs> what ref, ref, what reflects brooklyn i mean they clearly like retrofitted right the story in there but so you're right it was a good time then for you to come up maybe a couple years prior would have been maybe just a bit too soon i think so i think because even when we opened there was still very much so a kind of i think french people saw donuts as 
the worst of American, yeah. you know, they're industrial, they are greasy, they are disgusting, you know, so, which, <laughs> you know, which I didn't think of before opening, you know, I had no idea that there was this kind of correlation here with that. And so I think initially there was a little bit of kind of proving that like, you know, we, I say as well that we were always really lucky because in the first location we had, my kitchen looked out onto the street. And so there was like a bay window and you could literally see. So once we explained to people, no, there's like, you know, there's a pastry chef up there and, you know, you could see me up there like flower flying. And, you know, um, so once people kind of saw that, oh, they are handmade. It's a person. I think the fact that I trained here yeah, in France course. as well. Like and with- to be fair, I mean, I didn't grow up eating a ton of donuts, but they were, they were, you know, sure. Fattier in oh, the 100%. US. And, and yeah. you've done something that it also... Correct me if I'm wrong, but you seem to not use as much sugar as... No, yeah, I think I definitely... There are more balanced... Because I approach them... I've always approached them in the same way that I would have approached like any plated dessert that I was doing, anything okay. in my background, which was had its good points and bad points when I was first starting. Like, I'd never worked in a bakery, so I had only ever like done service in a restaurant, and I had no idea how to be like doing kind of like large-scale baked goods for people. And so the first few years... I literally was kind of like treating it as a service where I would do like mise en place and then be almost, I mean, you probably remember, almost like frying the donuts to order. Yeah, yeah, you know? yeah. Um, which was cool though, and it worked, it worked well. Um, but yeah, so I try and kind of balance, I balance them the same way I would balance any dessert that I'm okay. making. Which is why I think it's very interesting that the French have taken to this, obviously. You've catered events, you've been featured in, you know, big French magazines. Ina Garten has come see to see you. Yes, that was a career highlight. I mean, <laughs> <Yeah>. obviously. <laughs> yes. uh, Dory Greenspan just yeah. hosted a, a talk with you in, in New York. In New yeah. York. So love Dory, yeah. You know, clearly there is there's an understanding that this has a, a very legitimate place in the landscape. And I mean, the lines that I've seen outside your store. Now, one of the things you've changed over the last uh, I don't know how many years, a handful of years, is that they're all Vegan. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. And no one would know that. In fact, just before we started recording, Matthew Jordan, who uh, edits and and handles the sound on this podcast, uh, tried one and was like, yeah, that's great. Delicious. And then we said they were vegan and he was stunned. So obviously you don't need to advertise that they're vegan. Uh, vegans would come in, right? Yeah. So Inquiring. My, exactly. My attitude, because um, I'm vegan, so and so I know that Anytime you're going in someplace, the first question you always ask is like, what can I eat? So I wasn't worried about that so much because I knew that vegans are always going to come in. And we always had some vegan options. So people would always come in and they'd kind of be like, what's vegan? And when we changed the menu, you know, we were able to kind of like discreetly be like everything. (laughs) (laughs) But it was it was a conscious choice that I made because I wanted to show people that vegan pastry can be completely equally on par with traditional traditional bakes and so i thought the best way to do that was to just be a little bit sneaky about it and you now have created an entire book with yes. <laughs> vegan baked goods called voila vegan 85 decadent secretly plant-based desserts from an american pâtissière in paris or american pâtisserie in paris and i like that you use the word secretly i mean you really think that this is still a time when people need to sort of hide the, when they're vegan or not so much hide that they're vegan, but I think that it's still a time where people have very strong opinions and preconceived notions about what vegan food will be like. And so it was kind of a, a social experiment slash, I guess you could say almost like, you know, sneaky activism to be kind of <laughs> proving to people that there is good. Because I think you do get so many people who would either off the bat just not try it at all. You know, and so I thought, let's just see what happens if I make this my kind of like little personal project. And also remember that we've been open for five years before I changed all the bakery to being vegan. So I also didn't want to alienate all the people that had been coming and really loved loved the business. You know, like you you want to keep people happy. Sure. You know, so so I made it my goal to have the recipes taste exactly the same. And they do. I mean, that's that's kind of the biggest feat of all. And and that's not to say that there aren't still some baked goods that are not at your establishment, but obviously elsewhere that are harder to you know, to approximate, um, yeah. you know, don't deliver the same, I guess, flavor profiles. Clearly, there's enough in this book to show that, you know, you can do it and they do taste the same. In fact, Joanne Pye is the photographer yes. of this book and she told me that she had, you know, nibbled on stuff while she was shooting <laughs> and was like, you'd never know. Which is awesome. <laughs> Which is awesome. Yeah. So what I like about this book, too, is that you include a lot of anecdotes. So it's not just obviously 
you know, it could have been all French recipes done vegan, but you sort of do a mix of, you know, all of the types of goods that inspire you. Yeah. But you have these really fascinating anecdotes about your life here. And also not just here, but, you know, primarily here. Why was it so important for you to include these sort of personal stories that are that are very endearing? I mean, I know when I'm getting a cookbook, one, a cookbook like any book, I think I, I'm a reader of cookbooks. I don't know if you do this, but the first thing I do when I get one is, you know, I'll like get into bed and I love reading, you know, the backstories and the head notes and the intros and all that kind of stuff. And I also just thought, I don't know, I've had like a lot of ridiculous and funny experiences. <laughs> Can you tease one that you've included in the book that's quite... I mean, I think... And I, I also like, you know, like offering a, a little like snippet into Paris life. I think if I had to pick a favorite, it's probably the one about dancing naked yeah. around my apartment. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Yes. And getting caught by my neighbor. Right. <laughs> yeah. OK. So, you know, the, 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 there's there's a whole lot more that goes into being an entrepreneur and baking in Paris yeah. than what meets the eye. So speaking of vegan restaurants and, you know, a sort of vegan boom that we're having here. It's changed a lot, obviously, since you shifted your recipes to being vegan. Very much so, yeah. How does it compare, in your opinion, to other cities in the world? Obviously, I, I do want to say that there's a lot of Afro-vegan food here. Yeah. Because naturally, exactly. people don't realize this, but in a lot of parts of West Africa, for example, they already eat vegan. Right. Right. Yeah. Meat is expensive. So you have uh, Jaja, which is a vegan Afro-Caribbean canteen, which is awesome and yep. has been here for years. How do you think the scene compares? I think, as you said, it's rapidly changing and evolving in a good way. I think that, and especially to be in France, you know, which is like, I think they're the largest consumers of butter, like in the world, I think, <laughs> for real though. <laughs> and obviously, you know, meat is such a staple part of the diet. So I see it most, I think there are lots of really amazing and more so every day, you know, like every day it's like improving, you know, like you have like Faubourg the Amal and stuff like yeah. that, which is then like really leveling up to where you're getting like a beautiful, like kind of sit down restaurant experience. So you have things like that opening. Uh, that said, I think that there is still when I go back to the States, for instance, and like I'm in the grocery store, just the options that you have there are, you know, so I think we're get we're getting there and you can definitely come here and eat amazing vegan food. I find it more, yeah, kind of grocery stores and and in that kind of way, things that are sort of specialty stores too. There's just no right. It's, it's, it's limited. Very limited. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah. very limited. So where would you go if you were going to take a vegan out in Paris, aside from Faubourg des Monts, which is new, and that's owned by the same people uh, as Plan D, yes, which is a vegan sandwiches. sandwich place. Yeah, where would you take them? So I feel like if you're vegan here, you have to go to some of like the OG vegan shops because they're still really good. So you have Vigie Patisserie, mm -hmm. which is um, she was the first to open, I, don't, I think maybe 2017, 2018. And she takes the idea of doing really traditional French pastries. So they're really good for like croissants and things like that. I love Land and Mon Monkeys. Yeah, the bakery. The yeah. bakery. And I love that because you really do get the kind of traditional I love that, like, for somebody visiting Paris, for instance, you could take them there and they can get the very traditional boulangerie experience, but it's all vegan. And right. I think that's really fun. That's one place that I tend to go a lot. And then I also go to a lot of places, you know, you were saying foods that are naturally vegan, like you have like falafel and all that kind sure. of stuff. So I've been eating falafel here for 20 years, you know, right. so that's like a really easy and very like typical thing for, you know, to find here. Um, yeah, I guess a lot of Levantine cuisine could yeah. be... You know, as long as you're not, you know, as long as you're you're asking if there's, you know, cream put in anything, yeah. it's pretty easy to pretty, navigate. Really easy. Yeah. And then I, I also go to a lot of like Mao Dumping Bar is one of oh, my yeah. favorites. Oh, yeah. yeah. And it's great to go to places, I especially in some place where maybe you don't have that many fully vegan or plant-based restaurants. Um, you have a lot of places now that are also doing really excellent plant-based options. And so like Mao Dumping Bar is someplace that I go all the time so I can get my like tofu dandan noodles and dumplings. And, you know, if they're if I'm there with people who eat, you know, meat and, and other things, there's they can get they can get stuff there as well. So there's also the restaurant, the vegetarian um, restaurant, uh, Tekes. Oh, I haven't tried this. So that's that's from the group that does um, well, that did Balagan. Balagan has has closed. Um, uh, but that does Shabur, you know, the Israeli oh, yes. restaurant oh, group. Yes, yes, yes. And and so Tekes is all vegetarian, but they stipulate that anything can be made vegan. Right. Exactly. So you have this flexibility, I think, which yeah. is something we didn't have before. Although if you go to, you know, a classic brasserie, good luck. 
Good luck. You're going to be eating salad and fries. You know, uh, but yeah. <laughs> and, and you know, those fries potentially could have been fried yeah. in duck fat. That so is, yeah, that y- is true. You might need to ask some more questions. <laughs> yes. So there's, there's an evolution happening. What excites you about the way the overall the, the food and baking scene is going in Paris? Because, you know, you've, you've been here long enough to see how much it's changed. I feel like now we're seeing such rapid change in all areas of, of, of dining. Definitely, yeah. You know, do you think it's necessarily a good thing? Everyone is like, oh, she's, you know, she's done donuts. I could do donuts, you know. Like, there seems to be this, like, well, once it's been proven, I can jump in. But then we're just creating more of the same thing. I think that happens everywhere, though. You do? Yeah, I think so. I think anytime there's something that's really working, you know, you're going to have a lot of people, you know, doing it. And then hopefully, and I do think that this is what usually happens, is the ones that are really excellent are the ones that tend to hang around, you know? So I think it's normal to see an, you know, you're going to have trends. So I think it's normal to see an influx of one thing and then another. But the idea being, though, that the people who are doing it really, really well are the ones that are staying on top of the game and that are going to, you know, are going to be around. Um, I think at the moment, there's lots of like really exciting things happening here food wise. Like I mentioned the Faubourg d'Amont just because that I'm going there for lunch on Friday. Oh, there you go. It's it's in my brain. But I think, you know, to have more things like that opening up because it's really high quality, you know, and and you're in a in a restaurant experience. Exactly. I mean, it's not like a canteen. It's not a deli. It's not a. Yeah. You know, you know, like I love my lentil curry with Birkenstocks as much as every other <laughs> vegan, <laughs> you know, but honestly, but sometimes it's lovely. It's not it's more than lovely to be able to go in someplace and really just have like a regular restaurant experience where the food happens to be plant based. So tell me more about this, this book then and how you conceived uh, sort of the organization of the recipes. And if people listening, you know, pick up the book and want to try a handful of like your favorite signature recipes, what would they be? So here, what I essentially did is I wanted it to be an intro to vegan baking using the techniques that I used to change Bone Shaker's menu to being fully plant-based. So I then took those techniques and in certain instances, special ingredients and used that to make kind of an intro to vegan to vegan baking. So if I had to pick my favorites, the ones that I'm really proud of are... One, anything that's kind of custard based, Mm -hmm. because obviously that was a huge challenge for me. It took me about, honestly, about a year until I was happy with our like competition, our vegan version. I find that that's one that usually is a real telltale element to a dessert. And traditionally, people usually used to use soy milk a lot. And I Mm. do find that soy has that very distinctive taste where you could be like, the texture is good and it's not... It's not that it's bad, but you can really tell it's vegan. And my whole goal was I was like, I really do want these to be indistinguishable from from the traditional counterpart. So when I nailed kind of, well, creme brulee also, because like creme brulee is my favorite French dessert. And so I didn't, I was like, I'm not going to have a lifetime of not eating custard (laughs) desserts. So you do it, you figure it out. Yeah, yeah. You figure it out. Now, why is it that you don't have laminated no, in here. not in here, because I really did want to keep it more geared for like a home, home baker. baker. Yeah. But there is this idea that like I know, for example, uh, Chambolon, which is gluten free, not necessarily vegan, um, have not gone into viennoiserie. So laminated breakfast pastry because they're like, it's just too hard. We cannot we cannot do it to a satisfactory or, you know, up to our standards. So we do other things. Right. How complicated is it to do those kinds of goods in a vegan way? It's actually... It's okay. Um, we do, you know, we do our veignet at the shop, which are kind of our spin on a cronut. It's a little bit different, but it's um, same idea. And, you know, we're able, I think the big issue that they have is without the gluten that you're going to have a hard time getting that rise. Right. Whereas for us, you just need a sturdy fat, you know? So in that case, so you can use, you know, there's special blocks of margarine that actually a lot of the regular boulangeries are using anyways. And they just don't tell you. And they just don't tell you. So, um, oh. you know, so for us, we're using, but they can, you can get really high quality ones, you know, and sometimes it's, you know, they're so for us, and then you're just swapping out oat milk or whatever instead of instead of cow's milk, and mm-hmm. you know. And also, similarly, you you serve coffee. Yeah. Um. You've always served, you know, very good coffee. Are you still working with the the Irish roasters? Yeah, we work with Three Fe. Yeah, yeah, they're great. They're amazing. At some point, again, I don't even remember when. Maybe because I was always getting filter when I came to to, to Bone Shaker, but all of the milk based drinks are obviously with oat milk. Yep. 
And there are other places like that now, right? Buddy Buddy, we were talking about. Yep. You have a donut collaboration with them. Yep. We've collaborated with them uh, since they opened. They're fantastic. Right. And yeah. you're, so your donuts are often available there. And they're a nut butter yep. company from Brussels that also has coffee shops. And so all of the milk-based drinks are just plant-based. Yep. Um, in fact, they only do oat. But to, just to highlight that there, we're starting to see this become, you know, a conviction, yep. right? Which is awesome. You know, like we love to see it. <laughs> <laughs> so the places you collaborate with, is there anything that's sort of coming on the horizon that you're excited about or that you've done recently that you're, you know, especially proud of that shows how far I think, you know, well, Paris it's funny. Come? I think the Buddy Buddy collaboration um, is something that I think is really cool because we've been doing, um, I mean, their products are such high quality and we do like pastry creams with their nut butters. And I just think they're always really, really excellent. And I'm collaborating with 3FE in Ireland, actually, in a few weeks. I'm going over there for a book event. And they'll be doing um, donuts in all. They have five restaurants. And so they'll be um, stocking donuts in the five restaurants. And then we're doing a, a night of like goodies from the book and all that kind of stuff. So so there's an openness. Obviously, I, I wouldn't be surprised if Ireland, other parts of the UK, yeah. the US, they're, this, is, this is like a no brainer for them. Yeah, I think it's it's much more common over there. Yeah. Are there establishments, not that this is a show that talks about the U.S., but are there establishments like for, for listeners who can't get to you and get to Bone Shaker like that you would recommend for vegan pastry? Oh, yeah. I was just, in, yeah, I was in New York in September and I went to a bakery in Brooklyn called Le Petit Monstre and that was absolutely fantastic. Run uh, by French people? No, no, no. I don't think okay. so. But heavily inspired. They also, they do donuts and they do, but they do a lot of like puff pastry and venoiserie based and it was phenomenal. Um, so I'd really, I ate so much really good vegan food. When I was in Nashville, I went to um, a place called the Southern V and they do Nashville fried hot chicken, but it's vegan and it was mind blowing. Huh. So yeah, I ate, I ate really well when I was there. But I think, you know, for vegan food, there are other places that are, you know, far more advanced. We're, we're still... I think it's the early days here. I think, you know, we're getting there, but it's, you know, it's early days here. I think it's probably harder to go into a place as a suffering from celiac disease oh, time. than oh, yeah. or nut allergies, since we know people who have yes. severe nut allergies yes. and, and try to navigate dining oh, I, out here. I think so, definitely. My sister is gluten sensitive. She doesn't have celiac disease, but it's hard for her when she comes here, for sure. I think if you can't eat bread, good luck to you. I mean... <laughs> <laughs> womp, womp. I, know. I mean, it's possible. You know what I mean? I don't want to like discourage people. You said you do have like places like Chambalan and stuff that, you know. Yeah. But, but what people need to remember also that it doesn't, um, it isn't meant to be a substitute no. for French bread. It is a different product. Right. And, and I once, am thankful that as a vegan, I can still eat French bread. <laughs> right. Right. You know, it's, you can't, you can't lose all right. of the joy in life. No, can you? Definitely not. What do you think about Krispy Kreme? arriving. Yes. So Krispy Kreme, I think it's a little cheeky. You know, they're arriving down the street from us. Well, at Leal, yeah. Yeah. I think they will do very well. I think that Krispy Kreme donuts are really good. I It's American, yeah. I think it's out of America. Yeah, yeah. right? I mean, it's all over, but I didn't know if it was an American. I think it's I think it's American and uh yeah, I mean, we'll see. I imagine they'll do very well. And the way that I look at it when people do talk to me about it though, I think it's it'll be the difference between you know, going to like McDonald's for a burger or going to, you know, like a high end restaurant. Like we, our product is extraordinarily different to what Krispy Kreme does, but I think there's room for both, basically. Um, I just wish they weren't maybe moving in down the street. Right. <laughs> but, you know, some of the people that hang out around Leal don't even veer too far from Leal. Right. So I think in terms of competition, I'd be more concerned if they were on Rue Montorgueil. For sure. But they're, you know, at least slightly further afield. But yeah. But yeah, it's like comparing uh, Pizza Hut to, you know, Dan Pearson's pizza 100%. when he's doing right. pizza marole. So. Yeah. And it just does talk a lot, though, to how far you were saying the land. Like the Sorry, there's Popeyes in Paris now. I know. So, right. uh, like, excuse me. Right. Yeah, crazy. Remember when Burger King r returned yeah. to the Paris landscape <laughs> and there was like, yeah. you know, billions of people lining up? Now they, they've opened up everywhere and you don't even think about it anymore. Right. So, there's another conversation to to have on, you know, the the benefits and and horrors of having all these fast food 
right. chains. But it is interesting that is finally interesting. they've they've opened here. I think they've been in London for quite some time oh, a long now. Time. Yeah. So, you know, it's like, why now? Clearly the market is mature. Yeah. I mean, yeah, I think that it's, I mean, donuts are kind of exploding now at the moment, though. There's well. those like luxury donuts, too. Yes. I haven't tried because they're not vegan. So I have oh, you no, tried you can them? try the Momsy. Yeah. Right? Isn't that what it's called? Yeah. yeah. I think it's like eight to nine euros a donut. I've heard that. Yeah. Um, they're good. Um, are they classic? No. Right. And they're certainly not as generously sized as yours. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We do go. We balance the flavors for the European palate, but we American in size, baby. You're right. Yeah. <laughs> I think that's a good place yeah, to right? <laughs> to to leave this conversation American in size. So where do you want people to pick up a copy of Voila Vegan for the holidays? Uh, where's the best place? Where is it best for you? I know as an author, I, I get asked this quite a lot. And, you know, people are like, is Amazon good or not good? I mean, I guess Amazon's good. Am I not supposed to say Amazon? I don't know. I mean, I mean independent, your retail, independent yeah, bookstore. Exactly. Right. If it's in your independent bookstore, please buy it there. But it is available on Amazon. And also ask for it if it's not at there your you independent go. bookstore because they can order it in and it shows interest. Well, there you go. Yes, so, do that. <laughs> voila, vegan. Amanda Bankert, you are tremendous. You've done so much uh, for, for Paris and introducing people to things that are joyful. And I think, you know, we need a little bit more of that. So so here's to eating vegan secretly or not so secretly. Exactly. Well, thank you so much for having me. <laughs> That's the show for today. Thanks for listening, as always. If you're streaming this on Spotify, be sure to check out a little poll that awaits you pertaining to this discussion. Just scroll down on the episode page within the app and vote. And if you enjoy the show, I'd love it if you'd subscribe, share with a friend, and pick up the books that inspired it, The New Paris and The New Parisienne. Until next time, à bientôt.